Welcome to the 14th um, video in the Just In Case series, sponsored by Quality Equality, an OD consultancy firm based in Oxford, United Kingdom. My name is Mayan Chung Judge, and I'm the director of the firm. Um, this series is to encourage practitioners to do uh, bite-sized learning, to watch the video with colleagues or by themselves, and to reflect about your practice and increase your knowledge. Today, I'm really excited to introduce the contributor, Professor Dave Jemison, who was my um, colleagues and co-author in the global research on use of cell. Uh, Dave is an impressive scholar, academic, uh, practitioner. So he has 50 years of tremendous um, consultancy experience. He had a PhD and master program in St. Thomas's, and he contributed to the field enormously um, by being um, the past national president of the American Society for Training Development and chair many committee within Academy of Management and get Lifetime Achievement Award from ODN, not to mention the Distinguished Scholar Practitioner Career Achievement Award from Academy of Management. So the list of his award is very long. Um, but today he is sharing with you from his heart because he believed the cornerstone concept use of self in OD should be applied to equally to leaders. He has done a small piece of research and he's going to continue to explore how the use of self can be a critical concept in leadership development. So over to you, Dave, and thank you for donating your time to educate us on this. And everyone, enjoy. Well, thank you very much, Mian. Um I'm so pleased to be a part of this series and to have a chance to talk about what is currently driving me and inspiring me um, to take all of our use of self-work um, into the leadership world. So I'm really looking forward to uh, this opportunity. And um, I think as we look at today's in, as video, um, uh, I want to talk a bit about what is use of self, just briefly, so that we have an idea of the concept and the phenomenon we're talking about, um, why it's important for leaders. Um, we've done a lot of work in use of self within the OD field, and certainly many of the clinical fields, such as nursing and uh, clinical psychology, have also used aspects of use of self in their development work. Um, but we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about how it might fit into and, and improve the way we practice leadership. Um, and then I want to talk briefly about um, what we've learned from interviewing some, some of the best leaders. That is, when we've tried to bring um, some use of self ideas into understanding how some of the best leaders actually operate. And I'll tell you about how that was done. Um, finally, some ways that one, anyone can develop their use of self. What are some of the core ways to begin doing that? And a few practical first steps, because I think there's first steps for each individual leader. And I think there's also some first steps that could be really valuable for those who are in the leadership development profession. And they're trying to figure out all the things that would help a leader to actually be more successful. Let me just start by saying that the use of self is, is the core element in how effective we are in, our, in successfully executing our intended roles. So what that says right off the bat is, our use of self is with us all the time, and we are in many ways using ourselves well or not using ourselves so well. Because to develop to develop what use of self is about, we, we have to build it off of a platform of our own awareness about who we are and what we're really good at and what we get tripped up by and what kinds of biases sometimes blind us. And the more we know about ourselves, we have a platform from which to operate 
um, in in terms of successfully attempting to to uh, to execute our roles. And it also involves the clarity of our intentions, and um, and and a bit about the consciousness, the consciousness we have to the present situation. That is, are we aware of what's happening around us? Are we able to take in what's happening around us? Or are there other things that are, in fact, in some way blocking us or getting in the way um, and not allowing us to be conscious to what's actually happening? And then we have choices. That is, we have to be able to see choices and we have to be able to make choices about given a situation and given our intention, what should we do? What is the best thing we can do at this point? And then it's managing ourselves or managing ourselves in a purposeful way as we act so that, so that our actions are aligned with our intentions and our actions are chosen from the options we have uh, as we think about what's best for this situation and the people that I'm dealing with and serving in this situation. So, um, we, it is our pri primary instrument that we have available. Our use of self is our primary instrument that we have available. I want to talk about what some of the components are that um, people need to focus on and pay some attention about. And each of these, each of these opportunities to work on ourself or aspects of ourselves will be different for everybody. Everybody has their own landscape. Everybody has their own journey. Everybody has their own background and present. And, and so each person will have different needs and different ways to learn about and then develop in appropriate ways the best way for them to show up in their role. So <clears throat> the first part of this is self-understanding. That is, there are different aspects of ourself that we need to deal with. Um, we know, we all know that we have strengths and we have less developed areas and we have aspirations. Um, we have drivers and we have fears. Um, we have anxieties and we have things that we're highly confident about. That, that's just a simple way of saying that who we are and, and what our self is about is actually a mixture of, of different opportunities. And as we can see on this diagram, um, a simple way to think about the self is in the center. And that is where it's made up of personality factors, things that psychologists have been studying for decades about different ways to understand different personalities, our traits, characteristics, and style preferences. Many people take a variety of instruments in their workplace or in their personal life, and they learn things about certain characteristics they have or certain preferences they have in terms of how they like to interact with people and stuff like that. We have attitudes and values that develop over time um, and can change during our life. Uh, and we also have identities. And now our, our identities are partly based in in our gender and our races and our cultures, but they're also sometimes built in our background and the kind of area that we have come from and can also be profession based because each, each profession has certain identities as part of that profession. And then finally, we have knowledge and skills, the things we go to school for, the things we go to trainings for, the things we want to be good at and know about. And so our knowledge and skills is another part of what makes us who we are. And then on either side, we have how our self shows up. We have the personas that we that other people see and experience. The personas are, are in fact, about things that we choose to show or a role or a or a or a or a. Or a uh, a, a way of facing the world that we have helped to create, or we have habitual ways of being. And so we may go 
from one situation to another situation to another situation and show up very much the same. So we have personas. We also have shadows. We all have shadows. Shadows are about hidden parts of ourselves or parts of ourselves that have been denied. Um, another way of thinking about it is it's the way in which many people have recovered or, or, or tried to recover from various tra- trauma situations and, and various bad experiences that they've had in their life. And so sometimes they get deeply, deeply buried so that they are not obvious and, and conscious uh, to us all the time. Um, and there are parts about our, all of us that we just don't know. There's things that are unknown, things that haven't been developed or haven't, haven't been, have, haven't come out yet or, or even haven't, uh, or, or even we haven't experienced. So we call them the unknown aspects of self. So, um, so when we're dealing with trying to develop a greater understanding, it is not a weekend job. It is a lifelong learning process, and we're going to spend time and our experiences along the way are going to help us to learn about and understand who we are. A second core aspect or component is our intentionality. In order for us to be effective in whatever role we happen to be in, we need desired outcomes. We need to think about the kinds of impact we want to have. We need to think about what reputation we wish to have, what legacy we might wish to leave, and in in general, have intentions of what we think is the right and the best way to practice whatever the tasks of our role is all about. And, uh, And so the intentionality is something that we need to think about. And, uh, and we may need to think about it in each situation that we enter because the world we're in also changes and the people we're with also changes. Kurt Lewin, one of the wonderful fathers of the field that, that, that I've been in at least, um, uh, d- developed something where he helped us to understand that, that the behavior that we have is partly Uh, driven by who we are, who the others are, and what context we're in. So if we go from organization to organization or situation to situation, we are with different players who who we have different relationships with, and we ourselves might have different intentions for our role in each of those kinds of situations. So we have to be clear about What is the intention in in what we would like to accomplish in such and such a situation? The third piece of this is about presence. And a good way to think about presence is, is how much we notice and are attentive to what's going on and the people that are right around us in a present situation, whatever that might be. Might be a meeting might be a very large event, might be a one-on-one conversation with someone. And, um, and so our consciousness to self, our consciousness to the others, and our consciousness also to, um, to what, is the, what is the environment? What is the environment or the situation that we are now in? The context that all of us in this situation are being influenced by. Um, so that's how we think about our consciousness and our presence. The next piece is whether or not we see and understand choices. And choices in this case means choices of how we will be. That is how we will do things, how we will listen, how we will act, but it's how we will be there. And do we have choices? Our brain loves to have routines, and so what we are good at habitually doing will happen pretty much automatically if we're not being attentive to the options of choices. Choices bring us some freedom. Habitual behavior keeps us constrained in a certain way. So um, so in a sense, 
our choices are a matter of, first of all, what we see, and then secondly, what we feel capable of doing. If we are afraid of something, then we probably won't include that in our choices. If we can't see it, if we don't understand a choice other than what we always do, then we may not also do it. And so we want choices so that we have some freedom, one, to follow our intention, two, to deal with what's unique and special about the particular situation we're in, and then three, be able to act in appropriate ways to carry out what we'd like to do. So that brings us to the next item, which we call self-management. And self-management is actually both about disrupting our habitual behavior, because that'll happen almost instantaneously, time after time after time. And our brain will just keep that pathway working. So when we want to self-manage or do something different, we have to disrupt that pattern. We have to know it. First of all, we have to understand it. We have to know that's who we are. That's what we tend to do. Then we have to say we don't want to do that because we have a slightly different intention and we're hoping for a different kind of impact. And um, and so we're managing what we do behaviorally and we're managing our emotional side as well. So emotional intelligence and those kind of things play a big role here in how we understand our own emotions and how we understand other people's. And the last piece I want to put in here as to what, how we can understand use of self is we have to learn from our experiences. And, and learning from our experiences is about um, the importance of trusted feedback. We cannot see it all. But we and others who experience us begin to see it all. So what we need to do is have trusted feedback. We need to find ways to get that. We need to have personal reflective practices. We have to just not have a set of experiences every day, but we need an opportunity where where we and our brain review what happened, understand a little bit about why, figure out whether it worked well and met our intention or whether there's something else we might have been able to do. So reflective forms of practice gives us a chance to to be, gives us a chance to think about what might be done differently in the future. And, um, And basically without the reflective practices and without feedback from others, we can go on merrily operating in a very habitual pattern and not realize how much it's not helping people or might real or, or even hurting people. We might not realize that it's not meeting our intentions at all. And if no one's willing to tell us, and this can be truthful for anybody, but it can also be very truthful for leaders who are often at a slightly higher level in the organization. And if they don't know it, then they may think things are going well. So um, we call these action learning cycles. And um, as you can see on the chart, in the action learning cycles, um, we have we go through these action learning cycles all the time and uh, and every situation we go into. So, again, a situation can be anything in terms of interaction with other people. uh, things where you're in front of people leading them in t- terms of where you're supposed to be in a meeting and you're listening to someone else who guides it. There's all kinds of situations that we go through. And in each situation, we need to have an intention for what we wish to do in whatever our role happens to be in that in that situation. We need to be able to see it. That is, we need to notice things. We need to take in data. That is, we, we need to not have a lot of blind spots. We want to take in the data, not just through our filters, but with as few filters as possible so that the information we're getting is telling us a little bit about what's the reality of the situation we're in. And then combined with our intention, we need to make sense out of that. So what do we think is going on? What are the hunches we might have? What are some 
uh, what are some ideas that might start coming to us as to what's good and bad about this situation? So that's the evaluative piece or what variety of options might be useful in this situation. That's sort of an expansive piece. And, um, and we f- then think about our choices of what we should be doing, how much we should talk, how much we should listen, whether there's something we agree with and want to support that, or whether there's something we disagree with and want to be quiet about it, or we disagree with and we want to speak up and we want to share that point of view. And so we behave and things happen. That is, some things we can see that happens and other things we don't see. We don't see what goes on in the minds of all the other people. We may learn about it later, but we may not see it when it happens. And so then we have to have reflection at the end of these cycles. It doesn't have to be right after it. It could be later in the day. It could be driving to or from somewhere. It could be when you wake up in the morning. It could be before you go to sleep at night. Any number of ways to have reflective practices. But the reflective practice helps the brain to pick out things to retain. And that is the learning side of it is, is, the, is what's retained. And the things that aren't retained are fleeting experiences. You've had them. You may not even remember it three weeks from now. So um, so as we go through thinking about what actually is use of self and what kinds of things do people need to work on, um, it leaves me with one other important aspect, and that is every situation or system or encounter that we have with people is a new experience and it's a new opportunity for us to be our best selves. And that, and that's our ultimate goal is to figure out how we can be our best selves in all the variety of situations that we're going to run into. Well, let me, let me start this by, by saying a word or two about why I think use of self is really an important component for effective leadership. Um, first of all, all leadership positions at di- even at different levels to me carry a very high responsibility. And one of the aspects of how, of how responsible it is, is because people will follow all kinds of things that you say and do. And some people are more inclined to follow the leader. Some people are more inclined to be counter-dependent and not necessarily follow the leader. But what's important for each leader is to realize what they do and say, plus the power they have to, to create consequences and rewards, are a very important way to think about the kind of responsibility they carry and why having an appropriate attention and an effective delivery is a very important thing for leaders. The second thing is we impact many, many more people than a lot of other people do in their life because we could be a leader of five. We could be a leader of 500. We could even be a leader of 5,000. So in many ways, we're impacting a whole variety of people all the time. Um, And a third thing is we have very high influence on at least some of the people, and it's either through our words, which can be inspiring, which can be motivating, which can be attracting towards a goal or a, or a vision. And we also um, influence people with our behaviors. We influence people with what we ask them to do, but we also influence them with how we are using ourselves. And so because we are in uh, more of a spotlight than a lot of other workers in the workplace happen to be, then we become much more higher influence. And and the reason these things are important, I think, is because um, we have to have integrity about realizing that we are we are we are influencing good or bad. We are influencing lots of people. In fact. We are always a role model, whether we're trying to be or not. We're always a role model. 
And what's fascinating is we are either a good role model or a bad role model in a lot of other people's heads. And it's very important to understand that and learn it and put a little more respect um, and importance in the leader role and why, who they are and how they act is in fact very important. Now, we wanted to learn more about leaders who did a very, very good job and whether or not we could, we could learn from them whether or not they were practicing any of the things that we've been developing and discovering in the use of self. And so I want to tell you about, we had a sample of leaders that we were able to get access to at at a local company that had, it was a very successful organization with very high performance. And um, each of the leaders that we got to interview had very high team scores on engagement, commitment, and well-being. This is the kind of an organization that had an extensive set of measures that every team and every leader had measures for their team. And the, the sample of people we talked to was not a huge sample, but it was a good place to experiment and learn a little bit more about how use of self shows up in leaders. Now, We did not, we did, they had no knowledge of use of self. We did not introduce the concept in any way. We simply got permission and they're, and they're volunteering to talk with us. And then we created a set of questions to ask them about very common things that leaders do, um, and how they thought about things and how they process things and how they made choices. And uh, so we asked those kinds of questions. And then following that, there were two of us. So we had two people interpreting all of the answers uh, using using a very rigorous qualitative methodology to kind of organize them into clus- themes and clusters. And I want to tell you about what that actually brought out for us. So. So we ended up with four major themes that their answers fit into. And what's ironic about it is that there, those four are very important in terms of things we talk about and teach when we're teaching use of self. And these people were talking about it naturally. They were talking about it as things they've incorporated into how they felt about their leadership role. And um, I want to give you a, a sample or two. Um, on the, self, the first one was self-understanding. That is, they were saying things a lot of times that showed that they were working on self-understanding. And they would say things like, um, I recognize my strengths and weaknesses um, about myself, and I also recognize them in others. Um, another one would say you cannot lead without knowing how, uh, who you are and how you are experienced by other people. And then another one said, I observe and see patterns in my behavior. So those are all clues that self-understanding was behind the way those leaders who said those things were, were thinking about. Now, a second one, is intentional leader presence. So that title basically captured a whole bunch of things people said that talked about how important they thought it was that they were connected and present with people. So they said things like, um, a leader must have confidence in who they are and know what is important to him or her. Um, I show up demonstrating trust for my people. Um, I try to be a caring leader. So these are all about intentions and how they bring them into the present that they're in with other people. A third category was mindful decisions and actions. That is thought, thoughtful decisions and actions. So A few things that were important, I think, that came out of that group are in giving feedback, I practice it in my head or say it out loud 
to see how it may sound to the other person. I try to consider the other's point of view and try to assume positive intent. I consider the objective data and the subjective aspects of the situation. This is how I'm weighing things, in other words, when I'm trying to make decisions or take actions. And finally, the fourth category was reflective practice for learning. Again, without them knowing any of these words or topics, they just talked about things they did. And under this one, people said things like, I ask for feedback informally from people on my team. I'm reflecting all the time, morning and evening, even after the kids go to bed. I step out back out of the situation and reflect on the moment. I ponder what to say and how others may perceive me before I speak or act. Now, what we were uh, impressed by was that these are coming from people who never studied the concept, never thought about it, but have learned that they are good practices for them as a leader. And, and the other thing that's interesting is the, the team scores, that is their engagement, commitment, and well-being scores for their team, they were not all very high. They were all good to very high. And when we then ranked, then when we, then we, when we then scored people around these use of self practices in these four categories, we also had some of them higher than others. And the highest ones on the use of self turned out to have the highest team outcome stores. That's not a super big piece of research, but it's very, very inspiring to catch some of this reality and to use the reality to connect it back to how important this can actually be. Um, this can actually be for, for using use of self um, in leadership and, and, and making it more available and accessible to more individual leaders and also more organization sets of leaders who may be trying to develop the best leadership possible. So it's so it's very important that we that we talk about how people can develop use of self, their own use of self. Everyone's journey is different. None of them are weekend workshops. They're all a series of experiences throughout life and throughout working experiences on, and life experiences from which we end up learning more about ourselves, but also learning more about what works and doesn't work related to our intentions and what works and doesn't work for us to be happy and satisfied. So all of those experiences are important. So when we're developing our use of self, I think the most important thing to start with is a, is a wonderful phrase that came from a former professor of mine who wrote a monograph, and the monograph was called It Takes Two to See One. And it's built off of the very famous and original thing called the Joe Harry Window. And the Joe Harry Window basically is a model that tells us there are things that we know about ourselves and there are things that others know about us that, that we don't know. So, so what we know, some people know part of it. What they know, there's pieces of that that we don't know. So um, there's also parts of ourselves that none of us know, that none of us see and none of us know. And they can be Difficult experiences we've had that we've buried, but I, I need to tell you there's both sides of the coin on what's not seen as well and that or what's not known. And that is there's also capabilities and possibilities that we have never tried or never practiced that are also sometimes in our shadow. And um, so it takes two to see one means it's very important that we find a way to get useful and trusted feedback from key people in our lives who see us in action. 
It's not just your best friend who always has something positive to say. It's people you work with and people that you socialize with who get different experiences of you and how effective that is in what you're trying to accomplish or how you wish to impact the world around you. So it takes two to see one is where we have to start. The second thing is honest self-assessment. Honest self-assessment simply means um, we may not like some things that other people tell us. We may not like um, everything that occurs to that comes to us as feedback. But what we have to be honest with is how do we self-assess? What do we say to ourselves that is our truth? That is, what is our truth? And it's based, again, on all the variety of experiences we have and whatever feedback we've been able to get over time. Now, not the feedback from somebody who hated you as a kid. And you know that that feedback may not be that valid. It may be slightly biased. So we want feedback that is trustworthy. And it comes from people with integrity and people who actually see and know us and have our welfare in mind when they provide feedback. So the honest self-assessment part of this, though, is being honest with ourselves. And I say that that's a very important aspect as we develop. There's very few people I've ever met that don't have some flaws. None of us are perfect. And I have been through a lot of years, and I can tell you there have been major understandings and learnings in many of those years. And some of them came with difficulty, and some of them came with my own openness and pursuit of understanding things. So we want to build our own honest self-assessment so that um, so that we're thinking about the kinds of things that we want to improve. This gets a little bit on the borderline of the, of the role that coaching can sometimes play in people's lives. Coaching is great if somebody doesn't require you to do it. Coaching is great when you want it, when you volunteer for it. So it's a little bit why I say we need an honest self-assessment in our development so that we're choosing to want to get better at something. And then, then we can get help from learning more things. We can get help from coaches. We can get help from um, our trusted friends. A third piece of developing self is enhancing our consciousness and presence. Um, now, consciousness and, pr and presence means, for the most part, we are trying not to be distracted when we have a purpose in front of us and people in front of us, we're trying to be present and conscious mentally and physically in that moment. Um, and we're trying to bring our best self to all of these situations. So we're thinking here about um, some people like to use mindfulness practices here. Now, what mindfulness does in particular is reduces anxieties. It calms the body. And so if we're calming the body a bit, that gives us at least a better chance at walking into a situation, taking it in and being present there. And our mind is not then wandering and working on the next meeting or the last meeting or the problem I had with one of, one of the people I work with. So it's moving to the present and bringing the consciousness in that particular way. Then we have choices adding freedom and flexibility. So if we keep finding ourselves in the same habitual pattern, if we keep reacting to the same triggers the same way over and over again, then that means that we're not having any freedom to do something differently. And, and I often find that it's people not seeing choices. That is, I don't know another way to react. I don't know another way to be. And so we want to build, we want to build more um, 
um, choices for people. And we want people to see choices in the situation. The, the, what they are is options, things I could do differently, other things I could try, things I haven't normally done, and then and then weigh that against what's my intention and what's happening in this situation. And um, so the important thing with choices is it begins to expand our behavioral flexibility. And behavioral flexibility is how can we adapt ourselves to a variety of situations and needs. So we're trying to build out that behavioral flexibility. When people don't have that, they do, in fact, sort of be the same person time and time and time again, even with whatever's good about it and whatever's flawed about it. So, and then the last piece is how can we be in service of others? When we're doing change work, we have to be in service of others. When we're doing leading, we have to be in service of others. And that means our own self-understanding helps us to keep our personal agendas out of the way of the work that needs to happen with other people. And there are, there are so many times in life when our personal agendas overpower the agenda that we have in mind for others. And, and all that means is it guides and shapes some of our behaviors. And what we want to do is we want to remember that the better, the better we understand ourselves, the better possibility we have in our self-management to guard against our biases showing up when they aren't valuable in that situation or our, um, or some of our own needs showing up so that when I'm done this situation, I want you to feel good about me. That's a personal agenda that may have nothing to do with the work that we need to do together. So we want to try to keep focused on being in service of others. And that starts with our purpose, our mission, um, what we think is needed here. And um, it also is about um, knowing enough about ourselves so that we're keeping, we used to call it keep yourself out of the way of the work. And I think that's another way to think about that. I want to talk just a little bit about a couple of practical things that I think people can begin with. And I'd like to break it into two pieces. One is some practical first steps for any individual leader who wishes to understand and develop and use themselves um, in a better way. And then for people who happen to be in the leadership development professions and who are responsible to help all the leaders improve how well they're able to lead and how well they're able to help their organization succeed. And, and so for the individual leaders, the first thing I would suggest strongly is to find a self-development partner. Um, finding self-development partners are really valuable because two things happen when you have someone to talk to. Dialogue happens, which, which allows for a two-way interchange. Um, an exchange occurs where you have built-in person who can provide feedback along with others, perhaps, but a built-in person who can provide some feedback. And, um, and you have someone who you trust and is, is very valuable to you because they either have experienced your work or they see your work on a fairly regular basis. And, um, and you can have more than more than one of these too. It's very valuable. Over over my last fifty years, I would say most of the time I have learned to have both one male and one female in those kind of roles. They're informal, but they occur with exchanges and dialogues often enough that I could say anything I want and feel very comfortable with them. And they could do the same with me. And that's what makes a good self-development partner. Then I think another step that's very valuable is to write your own self-assessment. I said before, we need to have an honest self-assessment. 
writing it helps in a little bit with honesty. If you think about it and it's not recorded anywhere, it can also be another fleeting experience that you had. Um, When you write it down, you get to ask yourself easy questions and tough questions. And the writing down is using is using more than one of your senses and more than one of your skills. And so it actually has a better opportunity to support learning during that process. So I say write your own self-assessment, your strengths, um, the, um, the things that are difficult for you, the things that you believe strongly in, the things that are vul- you feel vulnerable about the things that trigger your anxiety, all kinds of ways to organize that. But the point is you're creating something and you're writing it down as a, as a second step beyond thinking about it. And then another thing is um, to uh, build in this, uh, this uh, uh, feedback piece a little bit more. And that is you select a few people who are around you, their peer, They're higher or they're lower in the hierarchy of where you are. Um, Or they can be just social network people who have a variety of backgrounds and work in different sectors of the world. Um, But you're selecting people whose, whose input you would value, number one, but you're asking them for some feedback about specific aspects of you. And where do you get that from? Your own self-assessment tells you certain areas that you need input on because you're not quite clear. So now you have a reason to ask some people for input. Another reason that's valuable is all the feedback literature suggests very strongly that feedback that is unsolicited is rarely useful. But feedback that you ask for can be very powerful in helping people make changes. Um, And then finally, I think the other practical first step is to identify one or two things that definitely raise your anxiety or cause you to uh, cause you to have difficulty often and make some plans to practice handling them in different new ways. That is, your, your self-development partner can be very helpful in helping to do that, but you, you identify the one or two things that are sort of most important that you'd like to improve or you'd like to not have them show up as often as they do or, or, or it's something you just know that when you do it, you notice what happens non-verbally with other people and you know it's not landing well. So you want to work on that. And so what could you try differently? How can you experiment every day in different ways and different places so that you're actually working on a priority for you and you're trying out different ways? And you've always got your self-development partner uh, who's around to help talk it out, what worked, what didn't work. This I tried and I didn't like it. I didn't feel comfortable, so I'm not going to want to do that again. Great. That's a learning cycle. So you move you move on to a new one. And um, so this is a way to think about getting started. Every individual can get started. When we've been teaching this in courses to people, um, we have individuals do the same kind of thing in the class. And these are people who, again, never heard of the concept, never knew what it was. And they take some kind of an elective course, and then they discover what use of self is about. But we have to build in the kind of things that are involved in this uh, practical first steps for individual people. And this way, this way, it gets people a start. Now, the other group I wanted to mention, of course, was, uh, was people who have responsibilities for leadership development. And... Uh, and they're often in human resources. Sometimes they're in talent management roles. Um, and sometimes they're just actually in leadership development roles. Um, and I think it's important that we 
that we influence them as well. Because here's what I see happening. In the 50 years or so that I've been practicing, I've been very involved in a number of leadership development processes. And for the most part, what we tend to focus a lot on is the technical side, the technical aspects of leadership. And we don't put as much attention on the interpersonal relationship pieces or the uh, uh, or, or how one person inf- impacts another person and how we can learn from each other in those interactions. And, um, and even self-awareness and, and, and self-knowledge has not often been an important part of that up until about the last 10 years. And in the last 10 years, a lot of leadership development programs have added in some aspect that is dealt that is dealing with self-awareness it could be emotional intelligence it could be mindfulness is brought into it it could just be a good leadership instrument that gives people feedback about who they are as a leader and uh and and i appreciate all those but here's what i want to say is a little different about bringing use of self into it and that is we need to bring it into programs as combining self-awareness with action, self-awareness with action, because so much self-awareness work is about knowing something, not about doing something. And I think that's one of the things where use of self always attaches action to understanding. And uh, so I think there's a way to bring that in. Um, and that would help a little bit to bring that as part of the philosophy underlying leadership development. Another thing that can be done in leadership development is, is creating peer coaching partners like the self-development partner or buddies of some sort, any of those models that where the participants that are going through it are never going through it alone. That is, we know so much nowadays about learning that we know that it's it's as much a social process as it is an individual process. And if we create opportunities that are built in, that are just part of the process where people need to interact with each other around things that are either pre-structured or become very open in the process, um, and that it happens more than once, so that it's cycling and reconnecting with these people so that over time there's additional learning going on that wasn't in the content of the leadership development. So that's a second way that we can do it. And a third way that I think it could be very valuable in leadership development work is having people work in teams on real projects, which mostly are called action learning stuff. And I noticed that that's also been growing in leadership development where teams of people work on real issues in the organization and that project then gets shared back with executives of the organization. And and so the people got to work together on something really important and they did it. And that that was part of the leadership development. and, and, And I fully support that. The piece that needs to be added is if the people could have some facilitated use of self sharing and feedback as part of that process, one would be what is phenomenal is doing work together is one of the best ways to show up as who you are in the good side of you, in the poor side of you. But you will show up when you're working. And if there could be facilitated use of self-sharing as part of that process, then people would start to gain more insights about what they can and what they could do differently and what they could do in another way. So, um, So in a way, these are a few practical steps that could get people started. And and I really wish people... um, uh, wish people well in, in, in taking their own journey as much or as little as they wish to do. Um, it's not hard to get support and help in this. 
Um, it's not hard to get even help in designing some of these things. We've been doing a lot of it for quite a few years as we've had to put together certain kind of courses for working adults who are graduate students often and, um, and, and helping them to find ways to improve that combination of the f- five or six elements that I mentioned previously about, about what makes up use of self and what do we pay attention to. So um, there are many other things about use of self for leaders. There are ways leaders get in trouble. There are ways leaders show up and cause great difficulties. And those are other issues. But they're just the downside of use of self not being done well. And uh, so what we want to do is give people a handle on how to take this um, and and for themselves or, or for many others that they might be responsible for. So thank you very much. And I wish you the best as you go forward. On behalf of everyone, may I thank you, Dave, for uh, sharing your amazing reflections and powerful insights in the connection between use of self and leadership I'm grateful for you taking the time to give us this knowledge. And I really like the practical ideas that uh, you offer towards uh, the end of the video, particular to our LD uh, colleagues. So may I urge all of you, regardless of your role, uh, begin to take some of these steps and put in some practice to grow your leaders' understanding and ownership of using themselves as an instrument. If you'd like to contact Dave, all the information, how to find him and his resources are at the end of the video. So a big thank you to you again, Dave, for taking the time to share. And everybody keep well, keep safe. Goodbye.